Some seriously interesting previews for the Gene Stealer Cult today. Three of their core characters have got some very significant buffs. We've got the full preview for the Reductor Saboteur and a few more interesting juicy details. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where today we're taking a look at the Gene Stealer Cult half of the Shadow Throne box as it gives us quite a lot of new and updated datasheets that we know are going to be in the Gene Stealer Cold Codex. I've already covered the Custodies changes in a previous video. Similar to them, this is basically a preview of the datasheets only, we don't know their final points costs barring the Saboteur, and there's plenty of other things that could really change how these units work, particularly all the army-wide special rules in the Gene Stealer Cold Codex. Still though, on the datasheets alone, there's some really quite powerful buffs, and it's been quite good fun to take a look through. Interestingly, they have included a small section of core rules for the Gene Stealer Cult, and they basically seem to be very similar to the ones in the current Gene Stealer Cult Codex, their Blip Marker Deployment and Cult Ambush. But there is an interesting designer's note at the end of the section, kind of implying that these rules only apply to the Shadow Throne missions themselves, and the way you deploy Gene Stealer Cult might well be very different in the actual Codex. Still a bit of a question mark with that one. It'll be interesting to see if they keep those Blip Markers, they go for something quite different. In any case, let's get into the datasheets themselves and start with perhaps the headline act for the Gene Stealer Cult, the Patriarch himself. The Alpha Bulk has seen some serious changes, a couple of reasonable nerfs, but I think that the boosts he gets far outweighs it in my opinion. First up, we have several changes to his stat line. He is now Ballistic Skill 4 plus for some reason, even though he doesn't have any ranged weapons. His strength has dropped from 6 to 5 though as he still re-rolls or wound rolls, he's going to be wounding most things pretty reliably still. Even toughness 8 things are going to be wounded more than 50% of the time. And he's also got significantly tougher as well. He's getting plus 1 wound to 7 wounds, and he has a 4 plus invul now. Both of those when taken together does mean that he's going to take a significant amount more shooting to bring him down. For example, if you're shooting him with bolt rifles, in the last profile you'd need around about 27 hits to bring him down on average, and now you'd need more like 42. That's over 50% tougher against just about anything with AP. His melee profile is very similar, strength 5 now, and he's gone to damage 2 rather than damage D3. But to be honest, that's only a small debuff against things that are toughness 6 or toughness 5. Hopefully there'll be some interesting ways to super him up in combat from the Codex. He has had a bit of a toned down of his living idol rule, the one that allowed him to give nearby units fearless. Rather than this, they now just ignore combat attrition modifiers, which I will admit is quite a lot less powerful. He's no longer just going to be a bobble of Ignore's leadership, and it does mean that big neophyte blobs might be a little bit more liable to run away. I think that was a bit of a sad change to be honest, but I can see why Games Workshop might have gone that way, trying to make leadership a bit more relevant to more armies perhaps. As well as this, at least on his datasheet, he does also appear to have lost Brood Telepathy, the combat plus one to hit buff that he gave to Gene Stealers. I don't know whether that might have gone elsewhere, it could be on the Gene Stealer datasheet itself, or a stratagem or something but it appears not to be here. He still has advance and charge, just like he ever did, but perhaps the other seriously good buff that he gets is that he now casts two psychic powers, not just one. That's going to make him a significantly better buffing piece, and now the role of the familiar is to make his psychic a little bit more reliable. They don't have their own stat line anymore, they just allow a once per game reroll on the cast. Overall, quite a few changes, maybe some of them positive, some of them negative. I think on balance though, getting just so much tougher to enemy shooting, and getting two psychic powers over one probably outweighs the nerf to his buffing abilities and also the minus one strength. One thing that I think is a small hope for him in the new codex is that hopefully he can actually make use of a cult creed now. I don't know if Games Workshop will stick to their guns and still not give him one, but it always seemed just a little bit weird that the faction leader won't be able to make use of their quirks, and all of his half-mutated minions can. Next up, and maybe a bit more straight good news, is the Magus and the Primus both of which seem to have several nice upgrades. The Magus has dropped a few power level, they're down to power level 4 from 5. The stat line and war gear are largely unchanged, in particular it confirms that Colt knives are basically the same, plus 1 attack and AP 0. Again though, much like the Patriarch, as the dedicated cycle for the faction, they can now cast 2 powers, so it is going to be a lot easier to field multiple spells in the Bloodline discipline compared with what it is now. I do kind of wonder whether or not the Broodmind powers might be reined in just a little bit. In particular, Mass Hypnosis seems like several psychic powers all rolled into one. I do kind of feel that they deliberately made the Gene Stealer Cult psychic phase really strong, but then they limited the amount of powers that their characters could cast. 
If they do remain anywhere near as strong as they are at the moment, then the Majors and the Patriarch are going to be some serious value. Otherwise, there's quite a nice change to their spiritual leader trait. Previously, it was a very slightly clunky rule where it gave your nearby units a chance to deny psychic powers that directly targeted them. Now that's changed a bit, and it just gives your infantry and bikes nearby a 5 plus save against mortal wounds in the psychic phase. With the likes of Grey Knights and Thousand Suns out and about at the moment, that could still be very useful, though of course it's not going to be relevant against every army. Overall though, it looks much improved, a decent buff to the cult HQs. It seems like a fairly similar story for the Primus as well. He remains power level 4, his stat line's largely similar, except his ballistic skill's been buffed to a 2 plus as well, he was already weapon skilled too, and he's actually become a somewhat decent combat character. Previously, his melee was strength 4, AP minus 2, damage 1. Now it's gone all the way up to strength 5, AP minus 2, damage 2. The item of war gear is called a cult bone sword, so it looks like that might be a change that's generalised to things like acolyte hybrids, and it might also be something that we see similar for Tyranids whenever they eventually get their 9th edition book. In any case, it is quite nice to have him be somewhat threatening in melee, even if he is a bit fragile still. Otherwise, his needle pistol gains a bit of range, out to 18 inches now, and his buffs have changed quite considerably in nature. Previously, he gave you a plus one to hit in melee when you're within six inches, and a bonus when you'd caught ambushed him in. Now I'd say it's perhaps a bit more general purpose. It gives you captain-style re-rolls out to six inches. Core units get to re-roll hit rolls of one when they're next to him. In addition to that, he can also nominate one cult core unit in the command phase, and they additionally get to re-roll wound rolls of one as well. It's kind of interesting that that happens in the command phase though, it does mean that the Primus isn't going to be quite as high value deep striking him in as he was. He's now more going to be a character that you want to start on the board to make use of that decent second ability. Overall though, he has become a seriously good buffing character. Say if you were supporting a big unit of 20 neophytes with this, reroll ones to hit and wound is going to increase their firepower by over 30%. Not bad for a character that's somewhat melee capable too. Just in general, it is quite good to see some buffs coming for the Gene Stealer Cult. They certainly needed them. Next up, we come to one of the biggest and most interesting data sheets of the book, the Neophyte Hybrids. Their stat line's unchanged, and they can still take squads up to 20, but they've had really quite a lot of alterations to their war gear. First up, as well as frag grenades, they also get blasting charges too. Blasting charges are an alternate grenade that you can throw. Only D3 shots rather than D6, but they hit at strength 5, AP minus 1, damage 1. That's going to be far more useful than frag grenades against most toughness 4 things and even more so if they've got a good save. Quite nice to see a grenade that's genuinely worth remembering. For the mining weapons, the mining laser's unchanged, still basically a last cannon shot at 24 inches, but the seismic cannon, which wasn't seeing us play quite as much, has been considerably buffed. Its long wave now is heavy 6, strength 4, and AP minus 1, and the short wave is heavy 3, strength 6, AP minus 2, damage 2. Good to see them both looking a bit more threatening, one as an anti-infantry gun, and the other as a marine killer, perhaps. Webbers have also seen a tweak to their rules. When you shoot them, you now get D3 auto-hits, and you have to roll equal or higher than the enemy's strength characteristic, and each time you do that, you get one mortal wound. It doesn't seem like a bad anti-infantry option to me. Maybe the sort of gun that seems really quite good at 5 points. I'm not sure if it'd be quite worth 10 points, though. Shotguns at 12-inch range, assault 2 and strength 4 now. So basically they're going to be better than the auto guns at 12 inches, but obviously worse outside that as they won't be able to shoot. Could be good if you're coming in from deep strike to get some extra powerful shooting. And most of the sergeant weapons remain the same. The only change is the power pick, which have now gone to strength plus 2, AP minus 2 and damage 1. Previously they were damage D3. That one's quite a relevant change as I believe that will change things for the aberrants as well. Perhaps the single most exciting change in the unit, though, is the one to the cult icon. If you include one of these, you get to summon more cult reinforcements to the cause, and every command phase, if your squad's taken casualties, you get to regenerate D6 models to the unit. This is kind of similar to the rule that they previewed for the Acolyte hybrids. I believe that you were getting D3 models back for them, so it makes sense that you might get a bit more for this cheap chaff infantry. Provided it's not too inexpensive an upgrade, I could see this being really handy. Certainly would punish your opponent for not wiping out squads, and you might be able to use the extra mobility for those returning models to get some of them more where they need to be. Finally, the unit does gain the crossfire keyword. That's that powerful new shooting buff, where if you can make it so you surround an enemy unit in crossfire units, you might well get plus one to hit and wound against them with your shooting. 
It will certainly take any weapon that these guys are shooting to the next level. Even autoguns are going to be pretty fearsome when they're plus one to wound against everything. But it does appear that crossfire is going to be more for the gene stealer cult shooting units, and it doesn't seem to be present on most characters. I guess we'll have to wait and see if things like the Keller Morph get crossfire. I can imagine it being a particularly good thing for that three-armed gunslinger. Finally, last but not least, we have the Reductor Saboteur herself. We've seen a whole ton of her rules leaked already, but it's good to get the last few bits of information. She is confirmed to be an Elite's Choice, not an HQ, for 80 points or 4 power. Her stat line's pretty similar to a fair few of the other Elite's Choices, though perhaps the most interesting thing that she does get is Ballistic is Skill 2+, so those remote explosives are going to be pretty accurate. 24 inch range, Assault 2d3 shots at Strength 8, AP-3 and Damage 1. A pretty nice bit of character screen shooting that the enemy can't do anything about, and it goes up to a pretty colossal damage 3 versus vehicles and monsters. Some pretty serious anti-tank on the go there. She seems like a good fun model to use. I can imagine it feeling very satisfying to imagine that you're detonating concealed explosives and bringing down an enemy unit. As well as though, she does come with a bunch of grenade attacks, which I can only imagine would largely never be used. The only one that would see play would be the demo charge, she gets one of those, and it's similar to the rest of the Gene Stealer Cult ones. D6 shots at Strength 8, AP-3, and Damage 2, and you can only throw it once per battle. That will be better than her remote explosives against things like 2 Wound Infantry, for example. Finally, she's got a few other fun special rules. She can do a Deploy Explosives action. Unfortunately, this isn't a whole turn action. It starts in the Command phase and finishes at the end of the Movement phase, so it's essentially in lieu of her moving. For that, it means you can set up her Reductor's Explosives marker, which when the enemy moves within 3 inches of it, you roll a dice for each model at the end of their move. On a 4+, plus, they take one mortal wound, and again, monsters and vehicles just feel it so much more, taking a massive 4 mortal wounds on the roll of a 2+. plus. Some pretty good area denial there, if you could get that down in a key point. Finally, she's got a few nice defensive rules. She's minus 1 to hit at range, gets plus 1 to her armor save and cover, Though admittedly, at save 5+, plus, that's not all that meaningful. But perhaps most importantly, if she's in area terrain, then the enemy can't shoot her unless they're within 12 inches. That's a seriously good rule. It means that she could keep on throwing out those damage-dealing explosives, even if all of her bodyguards get shot dead, or potentially even do some sneaky objective capturing, if the opponents can't get close enough to deal with her. Finally, as mentioned, it does appear that she doesn't get the crossfire rule. That would have been a serious boost to the power of her explosives, but it looks like it's going to be largely on infantry. Still though, I think for 80 points she does seem interesting enough. I think for the combination of doing some area denial with that mine, and throwing out some fairly reliable damage every turn, she could well be worth the price. It's just whether or not she makes the cut compared with all the other many Gene Stealer cult characters, all of which will be vying for the spots. So that's just about it for the information at the moment. Overall, I think that this is really quite good news for the Gene Stealer cult. Massive boosts for the Majors and Primus, I'd argue a reasonable upgrade for the Patriarch, and both the Neophytes and the Reductor Saboteur look interesting. As always, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, particularly if you've seen anything that I might have missed. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, where I will certainly try and keep up with any new releases from the Gene Stealer cult, and any news of the rules coming within their codex. I'll review the Codex in full once we have it in January. Finally, if you have been enjoying all these videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspex Tactics does have a Patreon page, and you can find that down in the video description below. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, including seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways, with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.